Hi everyone, welcome to Hot Seat with Cognizant Clay. I am your host, Clayton Terrio. Today on the show we have Alex Walls. Alex is paralyzed due to a virus called transverse myelitis. He is a gamer as well as a data analyst and he lives in Leicestershire, England. Hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, um, but yeah, personally, I'm pretty good. I'm quite used to this whole quarantine now. It's eight weeks for me, so uh, I just find the days blur into one, to be honest. How about you? Yeah, it's about the same. I mean, everything everything feels the same. And, and I actually started this blog because of it, because it's, it's something to do. And, you know, raising awareness for us disabled people is, is very important to me. And and when I discovered you, it was it it was perfect because I'm a gamer myself. Yeah. And I tried Rocky No Hands, but he's so busy that he can't do an interview. Yeah, I was going to say he does seem very, 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 very busy. And uh, yeah. yes, I'm no way at his level yet, but uh, that is the goal. To be fair, he is very good. He is, and it's it's pretty impressive. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you for doing this, Alex, because it's, it's cool. I'm glad we connected. No, it's, it's, it's perfect. I, I, I always enjoy doing these kind of things. So uh, it's a, any time kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, link up on Call of Duty one time, too. That'd be fun. Yeah, I'm definitely up for that. I'm on most evenings, to be fair, at the moment. I have a group of mates. And they're always like, you're coming on, you're coming on, you're coming on. I'm like, oh, maybe not. Uh, then, you know, it's like when you got people nagging you and you're like, oh, go on there, one quick one. And then they all turn, one quick one turns about five or six later. And you realize it's the half 12 and it's time to go to bed. So, uh, <laughs> but I'll definitely up for that sometime. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so j- just for my viewers know, so at eight months old, you contracted a virus called yeah. transverse myelitis, which unfortunately caused you to be paralyzed. Yeah. Just to start off, can you tell me a little bit about the virus? Because it was really hard to find info on it. So transverse myelitis, it's it's not. I, I'm trying to work out how to describe this. So I've tried to describe it in a way. Transverse myelitis is basically a bit like your cold, where it causes like with common cold and that you often get swelling sinuses and sort of like your back of your throat gets a bit swelled and stuff. Um, so basically, transverse myelitis is a bit like that, but within your spinal cord. So it's basically just swelling of your spinal cord which then, because you've got the vertebrae surrounding it, is then crushes your spinal cord, leading to damage. So then when the transfer myelitis leaves and is gone, you're left with this damage of your spinal cord. So it's sort of like the transverse myelitis itself is the virus um, caused the paralysis. Does that make right, sense? Right, okay. So it's, yeah, it's, that makes sense. That, that, that's, that is my best attempt at explaining it without probably... a. a uh, people still technically I'm left with a spinal injury caused by transverse myelitis. I don't think I've still got transverse myelitis. If that makes sense. It's a weird one. Yeah, it is weird. My mom works in a hospital and she was saying yeah. how it, you know, it happens a lot in young children, like babies. Yeah. And it, it oftentimes it does cause paralysis, which is rather unfortunate, but you seem yeah. pretty happy. So yeah, I, I, I think I'm to be honest, quite lucky that happened quite young to me. I think that's why I feel anyway, because I, I hadn't known any different and just carried on life as normal. Yeah, it's my... quite similar to me. The Duchenne muscular dystrophy was diagnosed yeah. at nine months old. So yeah. my parents knew it was going to be a thing. And I, I think you can probably relate. It's easier to adapt when it's all you know. Yeah, I, 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 I know loads of people that probably struggle. They've had it in their teens. I've met in hospital, they've got it in their teens, 13, 14, 15, you, a big stage of your life at that stage, and it just flips it. So uh, I do feel lucky in a way that I am when I was younger. Right, yeah. So no, it's, I, definitely, I, it's definitely true, I think. So can you tell me just a little bit, what challenges do you face on a daily basis due to your paralysis? Uh, I suppose my worst issues, really, uh, well, I'm quite I'm quite active in a way. I, I work full time, well, normally anyway. Uh, I'm a data analyst. Um, and I travel about an hour away, so I, so day to day challenges. I don't really have many that I. It's weird because I'm used to them, so I don't really see them as challenges in a way. So, uh, 
I, more of a ways I've got around them, but it's sort of like, I, I, I struggle in the mornings getting ready. I can't do it myself. I have carers come in in the morning and in the evening, well, normally, my mum and dad have started taking over the care for the period of time just because it's safer with coronavirus so that uh, they carry on with it and they've took over that. Um, so my driving, I have a fully adapted car, which I can drive myself, don't need any help with that. So I suppose that's a challenge, but I've overcome it. Um, Work-wise, I'm pretty, I work in IT, I'm a data analyst. So I pretty much have always grown up on computers. And to be fair, even though I've not got the best hands in that, I've learned to use the, uh, just your normal keyboard and mouse. Just because when I was at primary school, middle school and upper school, unless I was going to unplug keyboards, unplug mice and stuff, I just got used to it. So uh, even though there is stuff that, and plus it's expensive, you want multiple lots of it. So it's, it's just one of these things that I got used to that. Um, and then I suppose my biggest challenge actually normally is just for spasms, trying to control them. As I'm driving about, sitting about in my, in my chair, pushing anywhere, I get a spasm and it's just a pain. So to be honest, that is my biggest challenge. It's, it's just spasms just occasionally when I'm, I get my momentum. I feel a spasm coming in my legs and half the time I just will stop just so I don't lose my balance and fall in my chair or something silly like that. So I, I suppose my, they are my main challenges. So... Uh, yeah, and it seems like it. Like I say, you seem very positive and very, you know, used to it. I, I'm. I feel yeah. the very same. As I relate to you a lot. Where it's like, yeah, I have challenges, but what am I going to do about it? It's. It's. There's nothing I can do. Yeah, it's. It's, it's a bit of a weird one because I've had people ask me that before. Like, what challenges do you have? I'm sort of thinking, well, I, I don't really I can't really think of them to be honest. Like, do you remember your list them off? So, like, if I know when in the past if I'm doing a project or something. I said, I can think of loads and loads of challenges that, that slowed it down. But it, it just, it's life, isn't it? So you just don't really think about it in such a, such a way. Yeah, for sure. And, and I just want to know, like, while you were growing up, who motivated you the most to stay positive and, and focus on what you can do versus what you can't? I suppose it's my parents. I've got, I've got two brothers. So I've got an older one who's two years older than me and I've got a younger one who's two years younger than me. So I'm sort of like slap bang in the middle. So I think my family have always been busy and we've always done stuff. So I think it, I just haven't really had the time to, to not. Do you know what I mean? Do you know when you're busy, you, you're doing yeah. stuff. You just don't have the time to not think about it. I went to a mainstream school. So I was with 30 other kids in the classroom where I was the only one with a disability. So it's sort of like, even there, I've had no, no time to be like, oh, boo-hoo, go, kind of thing. I've just got on with it. So, yeah. I, and, and, and to be fair, everybody at my school did as well. I, I, it was weird. It's sort of like one of these things where you sometimes forget, if that makes sense. I sometimes forget that I am disabled and, and, and quite disabled as well. It's, it's, when, it's, when, it's when you see other people who are miles better than you and you're sort of like, oh wait I can't do that and then you're like oh oh yeah I'm the same it's just it's a weird one so it, I, I, I don't know I just I don't think anybody's really motivated me but I suppose my parents have had a big impact on it and my family have so, right. and friends as well I suppose it's just yeah I want to I want to do stuff and we're doing stuff so I just get on with it and it's I don't know I suppose yeah. it is yeah yeah it's the way to go um so so despite being able to use only 30 percent of your body you are yeah. you actually game quite a bit what what turned you on to gaming like was it from a young age or like what about it made you want to pursue it to stream it um i started very young i, I think most people like i say i got two brothers so uh when we were younger about seven or eight i think we got a second hand playstation one or playstation two and it was just one of these things where you in the evenings, you, you'd play with your brothers. And when the PlayStation got here, we were all on the PlayStation together. And uh, I'm competitive. I don't like losing to them. So you, you learn to use it all. And uh, it just went on from there kind of thing. So uh, as new consoles came out, as new things came out, as, on, as, as online gaming came out, I just evolved along with it like everybody else did normally. And then when I was at uni, um, I can't really remember how it happened. When my mates were like, why don't you start streaming? So I thought, yeah, well, I'll look into it. And I started. So uh, 
it's just one of these things and it just it's sort of like as technology evolves and as things evolve i tend to do it with it so i've just carried on since then and it's just second nature to me really so yes yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun too right like it's it's something to do and and the thing i relate to it is is well you as a fellow yeah. pretty handicapped person it's yeah. it's a way for us to do physical things and play sports and and yeah. you know just enjoy yourself that it, it really helps yeah i i find it's a great i sat there thinking the other day there's two things where i don't feel the same if that makes sense my driving because when i'm on the road nobody knows i'm in my car and nobody knows and i'm driving on the same road as everybody else the same speed as everybody else and literally you can look in my van while i'm driving you can look in a car next to me and unless you see my hands or something you wouldn't have a clue and gaming is the same with that where i'm on there and playing with you you've got the same chance of killing me as i've got the same chance of them killing them if that makes sense if i'm playing card or if i'm the same on fifa or anything like that you've got a good chance of me beating you even though my disability and stuff so it's i do find it's one of these places where you find a level playing field from the beginning yeah for sure and what would be your favorite part about playing video games would you say i know it's probably hard to narrow down but i think it and i like the social aspect as well a lot in the evening i think it's one way where my mates that they're quite active to be fair they'll go and play football they'll go and do this they'll go and do that so gaming in a way is a thing that we could do together that makes sense so, so, so I, I i do sport as well i play with rugby but it's not something like they can always go and play water rugby with me, and that, if that makes sense. So it's one of these things where an activity that me and my mates can do together all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those. Yeah, for sure. And I can relate again, where like Forza, FIFA, COD, yeah. like no matter what it is, you're playing with your friends. And I've actually got one of my best friends, Tom, is from yeah. Liverpool, and he moved over to Canada. Yeah. And we play FIFA all the time. We just, yeah. we're always, you know, oh, yelling yeah. at each other over the mic. It's super competitive, but it's so much fun. It, it really is. It's almost like a coping mechanism, right? It is. It is. It is. I, and to be fair, I found myself on it a lot during quarantine because it's a way to keep in contact with people. Right? I, I find it might be quite bad, but I struggle with a, if, if, if I've got to call somebody every day, you know, talk to them or all right kind of thing. I find that you're just asking the same questions and you've not done anything. So there's not much to talk about. Whereas when we're gaming, we're sort of like, you're having those conversations, but you're also doing something together at the same time. So you're talking about your game, but you're also talking about how you're doing. Like, if that makes sense? So it's sort of like not just yeah. constantly, oh, how are you doing? What have you done today? And then you emphasize on the fact that you've been sat indoors all day and you've not really done a lot and you're a bit fed up kind of thing. You're doing stuff together and you're talking like you normally would if you're out and about you and you're meeting a mate. So it's, uh, I do find it's great that way, to be fair. Yeah, and, and it's, so if you were to give advice, because I'm personally thinking of starting streaming as well, yeah. what advice would you give to someone who's starting to stream? That's a good question. I think you have to think about which way you're going from. I think you have to be social. I think that's a very important thing. You have to have a, a bit of personality about yourself. Um, it doesn't matter if you're good at gaming. I think that's another good thing. I think people have to think that you are have to be the best at a game. You don't. You just have to literally have something about you that will bring people in and get them talking to you and be engaging and sort of like talk. And the biggest thing that I find annoying when, 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 when I go into somebody's stream and you say a message in the chat and you say hello or something and they just blank you. It's just, I think it's one of these things. I'm always a social person and how I reply to literally anybody. That's why I, I get some weird DMs and stuff on Instagram and other stuff like that, but I'll still reply to them and give them a chance. And then when they get uber weird, I'll sort of like just kick them out of the park. But it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, I think you have to do, be a social person and be, be prepared to get some weirdos and just talk to them and then, get rid of them when they get a bit weird. Uh, I, think that, I think they're the best ways to go about it, to be honest, but uh, you just gotta be yourself, to be honest. I think, I, think, I think that's the thing, don't change for anybody, be yourself and do what you enjoy. And if you do what you enjoy and, and, and it's visible that you enjoy it, um, people will come. 
Yeah, for sure. And like you say, there is some weird people on the internet, but at the same yeah. time, I think a lot of people think, oh, I got to put on a persona. Well, no, you don't. Yeah. You just no, you tell you, you're just yourself. Be if, if you're faking it, someone's going to know you're full of it. And, and that's no way to be faking it till you make it is not good. I think just yeah. grind as yourself and that's yeah. all you can do. Exactly. I've, I've seen a lot of people who, who chop and change and that. And I think even I did at the beginning, try to persona this persona and do this, do that. But it don't work in the end. You've just got to be yourself. It's, like you say, somebody will find out and then you'll get a bit screwed over. So uh, it is one of these things. You've just got to be yourself, I feel. And, and as long as it looks like you're enjoying what you're doing and, and you're going about it the right way, I do, it don't matter. But I think I wouldn't say I'm, I'm nowhere near a big streamer. I'm probably not even near an average streamer. I'm probably a bit on the lower end. But it don't matter me. You've got to sort of like just take this grind slowly and go from it that way. And and it's what I'm doing. And and I don't. It's always going to be a hobby for me, if that makes sense. Even if I get to this level where I'm making money that I don't need to work or something like that, I still wouldn't quit my job. I still wouldn't leave it and go and do and, and do streaming full time and then just drop everything else. Because it's, it's, it's just, gaming has always been a hobby, but I never want to make a career out of it. It's just something where I sit and think, well, I'm playing my PC now, I'm playing my Xbox now. Why not have that social aspect as well and talk to some new people who might want to watch me and learn about my disability or learn about disability in general? So it is one of those things where, just, just I don't know, it's just one of these things where you've got to work out which way you want to get going. What, whether you want it to be a hobby or whether you want it to be a career and then you've got to try and do it that way that's what i'd do anyway <laughs> yeah and that's that's what i'm thinking like i don't want to make making money would be nice but like you say oh, raising yeah. that awareness for the disabled community is yeah. is my end game exactly i think the same with mine when i first started off i started thinking well when i'm playing these games nobody knows i've got a disability but if they did and they know that people play the games and stuff then Hopefully, it'll raise awareness. And to be fair, there's not much representation of disabilities anywhere, really, in, in a positive light, put it that way. So and anything helps. That's why I see it. So, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, the other thing I wanted to touch on was you play wheelchair rugby. Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about that? Because I'm, I'm fascinated by that. So, yeah. So I, I, I've been quite bad recently. I haven't played properly for about six months but not because of coronavirus just because i'm so busy at the moment um but um so would you rugby it's a uh, four side game played on a basketball court um for quadriplegics um is that the right one i don't know so I, I know different languages are used across the states and the not the other side of the atlantic to we are so uh, if it, basically if you've got a paralysis or a disability in all four limbs um and it's basically it's nothing like rugby it used to be called murder ball, but to get it in the Paralympics, uh, you can't really have a sport called murder ball. Um, so they, they renamed it wheelchair rugby. And uh, basically, in essence, you've got 40 seconds to get the ball across the other line on the, the other side's butt, side of the basketball court. So instead of a hoop, you put the ball through. You literally just got yourself, got to get yourself over this line with the ball on your lap. And it's pretty violent. Well, not violent, it looks it. If you, have, you, have you seen YouTube clips? Yeah, I have anyway? seen it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it looks it looks worse than it is. And personally, for my, it's quite funny that I, there was one time when, um, when I first started playing, and it's a funny story, when I first started, I went to my first tournament, and there was a big, big lad in a wheelchair, and he was quick, and he was going, and I was sat there watching this guy, and he went flying to this girl, I think she's about five years older than me, and she ended up falling out of her wheelchair, and and dislocating her shoulder, and I spent the rest of the morning thinking, "Oh God, oh God, oh God, I'm going to die." Because if this guy goes flying into me, I'm a skinny little thing. So I thought, "Here we go. If this guy goes flying into me, I'm flying out the wall. I'm going, literally going to be flying backwards, flying into this wall, and knock myself out." So stupid. So then I spent the whole time thinking, oh, "I'm going to try avoid him." So so I tried to avoid him for about half the game. And then suddenly the ball came to me. I, I, I'm not very good at catching it, but somehow I caught it and he went straight into me. I was like, I didn't feel anything. I sat there thinking, I spent half the game panicking, thinking, if this guy comes into me, I'm going to be going flying. But because the way the chairs are designed, you don't feel any force or anything like that. 
she just got incredibly unlucky with the way that the she was going like the way he caught her and the way she was going it just led that she went on the floor and just getting her shoulder so it's one of these ones where i think people watch it and think oh god yeah, that's scary but actually it's 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 not too bad when you're playing it so uh yeah <laughs> that's that's a pretty crazy story and i think you're right i yeah. think it was just the angle at which he probably hit her she went flying and that's yeah. just it <laughs> that's just it it's one of these things so it's a uh yeah it's one of those it's, it's a good sport it's a good one to play where uh i did play basketball but obviously my uh, level of disability was not up to everybody else's and they were just so much quicker and stronger than me that i wasn't always going to get left behind so uh it, i do enjoy it though but I, i've not really played it too much the past eight months kind of thing just because i've just been so busy yeah, and it, it, I think life life catches up with us sometimes. And life does catch up. When I was when I started out, I was every weekend, but now I went away to uni and I've come back. I've got a job now, that and I've got my girlfriend as well. And it's just one of these things where at the weekend it takes about seven hours of my of my Sunday if I'm going to go and do it because I've got to drive there, which is about an hour and a half. Drive back an hour and a half, so that's three hours just traveling time. So it's one of these things where it's just life, isn't it? You've got to try and prioritize stuff. So. Yeah. 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 So I have a little, I have a segment here that I do with my guests called rapid fire, where I just ask some Ooh. random questions just to get to know you a little better. Yeah. So cool. to start off, who would be your favorite person from England? Favorite person from England? What in generally, like just in general? Yeah. Just anybody. <laughs> oh my God. This is a tough one. <laughs> Favorite person from England? I'd go. Oh my days! You're good at these questions. I'm thinking about it too much. I'm a big football fan. I'm gonna go Jamie Vardy. He plays for my team. I support. He's done a lot. I'm gonna go Jamie Vardy with that. Yeah, Jamie Vardy's having a party. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm a big Leicester fan, so uh, he definitely Jamie Vardy's having a party. Well, and yeah. I find that that like especially in England where you're from is who you cheer for. So it's like, yeah. I, as soon as I saw Leicestershire, I was like, he's definitely a Leicester fan. There's no doubt. Well, well, technically, I'll leave into a little secret. I'm not from Leicester. My granddad and my great granddad were Leicester fans. And my mum and dad, well, my mum moved down to a place called Suffolk and met my dad. And then they had me. So I've lived in Suffolk my whole life. But I went up to Leicester for uni. So, uh, but, but I am a Leicester fan through my grandparents. So it's one of these, it's a family thing. So, uh, but yeah, I get what you mean. It yeah, is, no, it is. exactly. Yeah. Um, so what would be your favorite thing to eat? I love pasta. Anything pasta. Like, I love a good lasagna. I like a good spag bowl. I like a carbonara. But pasta is my, I could eat pasta every day if I could. Yeah, for sure. I agree. It's a good one. This is, I figure this might be a hard one, but what is your favorite video game of all time? I'm a big football fan. I'm going to go for the FIFA series. It's one of my favorites, but I also quite enjoyed Modern Warfare 2, mainly because my brothers and I would play it for hours and hours and nine in, in the evenings, just three of us. So it's either the FIFA series or Modern Warfare 2. I wasn't ever very good at Modern Warfare 2, but it's just... We used to play the three of us. It used to be quite fun in the evening. So uh, it's that one or that one. Yeah, those are, those are two really good ones for sure. Uh, if you could be any person, living or dead, for a day, who would you choose? <laughs> living or dead for a day? I, I don't really know. I'd quite like to have been alive in the war, to be honest. So Winston Churchill, I don't know. I just feel like that would be quite interesting. Just to, I'm, I'm quite a bit of a history person. I quite enjoyed that. So I think that would be quite cool, just to sort of like know of, know of stuff before it happened and actually be there to witness it. Even just being the fly on the wall would be quite cool, to be fair. But I'd go with, that. I'd go with him. Yeah, he did, that's a great pick. Him around D-Day. I think that would have been... Something pretty cool. But also yeah, very, very stressful, time. but very, you know, iconic for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I'll just get back into the questions here just a little bit, just to 
to close off, is there, are there any charities or awareness groups that you support? Um, so I've done quite a bit of work and I had quite a bit of support as well uh, from a charity here in the UK called the Backup Trust. Um, when I was 13, I had never had any specialist spinal support or special spinalist care. I've literally just was working through my um, local, local, like local hospitals and stuff. And I had never had anything specialist. And when I was 13, within a space of two weeks, I went to, I was referred to as Stoke Mandeville Hospital, which is a spinal specialist unit here in the UK. And I went away for a week when I was 13 um, on a multi-activity course with uh, other teenagers uh, with spinal injuries, which was the first time I'd been away um, without my parents. Um, and they literally, it was, I, I, when I, at the time, I think 13 year old me was very apprehensive about going and didn't really want to go. But sort of like when you're there a few days in, it was, it was sort of like showed me what I could do. And I can go away about support, like from my parents and that, and I can do this and I can do that. And they've done stuff for me and I've, and I've volunteered for them as well. I've ended up about five or six years after going as a participant on the course. I ended up going as one of the leaders on the course. So it's, it's, they've done a lot for me and I've done some, I've done some charity work for them as well. So I'd definitely say the Backup Trust, uh, a great organization for those with spinal injuries and stuff. So, so if you are in the UK and you've got one, go check them out. They are pretty cool. Yeah, that's a, well, that's awesome to hear because it, that's really good. Like I think showing yourself as a young disabled person that you can be independent is very, it's yeah. very like almost a revolution, a personal revolution where it's like, oh my God, I can, I can do it. And it's, it, it's really quite rewarding. So thanks for sharing that. That's, that's cool. And I think they also, I just want to add another thing that they also sort of like, I think they changed my opinion on what independence is, if that makes sense. I think there's a few people with high level injuries who were there and they said, look, there's no way I can be in, independent in, in a, like an able-bodied person's view where they literally do anything themselves and they could do it. said, but what I can be independent of is I can organize my own care. I'm not relying on anybody else to organize my own care. I can organize who helps me with my care, who organizes this, who does that, who does that. And I think that really sort of like showed, because like him, I, I could not be independent going out without anybody helping me or without any care. But he showed me that actually, technically, I don't need to rely on a family member or a friend. I could be independent and have that sorted out by myself and have that all planned. So I'm not relying on family members and friends and I'm independent in that regard. So I think that sort of like helped me change my mindset again a little bit that way. So I just want to add that. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Th thanks for that. That's a good little tidbit that, that, that it's good awareness too, just to tell people like, you know, it, it's, you're not going to be able bodied, but what you can be is self-sufficient and self-reliant. Yeah. I think that's it. I, 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 despite my disability. Yeah. You can be self, self-sufficient. I can't say it. It's one of those words I can't say very self-sufficient and self-reliant without actually, uh, yeah, like, like you said, I'll let you, you, you explained it better than me there, so I'll just leave it, like you said. <laughs> yeah, it's good, it's good. Any input is, is very much appreciated. So during, during this time, it's obviously a little harder for people to keep the awareness going, but how do you think people can keep raising the awareness for our community during this basically shutdown? I, I think one thing I, I probably am guilty myself of thinking about is that, and I've seen on Instagram as well quite a bit, where there's actually quite a few people that actually, once quarantine is over, they are still housebound in a way. And they are still by themselves. And I'm guilty of this as well. I completely forgot about them. But within two or three weeks when people are moaning about it, they're like, look, this is me the full time. And I sat there thinking, I felt quite bad, really, in a way that even I didn't acknowledge that there's people who are stuck in quarantine for most of their lives just because their disability stops them. So, sorry, I've sort of diverted from your main question there a little bit, but... 
I just, uh, what, what, what was it again? Sorry. Just how do we keep raising the awareness during the shutdown? I think it's just one of these things where you got to. I don't really know actually. It's a good. That's a good question. Keep raising awareness. I think you've just got to sort of like, in a way, people not. I think you've got to try and sort of like not draw too much attention, but also not forget we're there. I think I think that's from my from my point of view. I want to be included, but I don't want to be made a show of if that makes sense. So that, 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 that's from my, my personal point of view, where I can, if I could do everything everybody else can do, and I'm not seen as some sort of like speciality kind of person, God kind of thing, then I'm not saying I am kind of thing, but you know what I mean, where, where I'm not made a special show of, then that is the perfect sort of like area for me of in inclusion and trying to raise awareness. But I'm not really sure of a good way to sort of like highlight and promote our inclusion into sort of like society more during a lockdown at the moment because I suppose any sort of society right now, everybody's stuck inside and just any kind of sort of like society right now would be great kind of thing in a way. It's better than just being stuck at home with mum and dad. So I don't really think I've answered your question there very well, but uh, <laughs> I attempted it. So. No, I think I think yeah. what you're saying in the beginning too is yeah. shedding light on, you know what, this is normal for a lot of people, and and I think yes. I think it really highlights it. It really provides perspective for other people who aren't who are able to go out whenever they want, and it's it's very, it's it's kind of mind blowing in a way how everybody is stuck inside right now. It's it's quite crazy to be honest. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the kind of point I was trying to put across. But you would it miles better than me. That this, even, even though it's not normal for us, sometimes this is normal for people. And it's also important to acknowledge that during the situations and afterwards as well, that there are people in this. And, and when, when you're checking in on people, giving them phone calls daily, just because it's, it's in quarantine, all of a sudden everybody's in the same boat. But actually, once this is over, you've got to carry on doing that for those that are still in this situation. And maybe those who are struggling, like I know here in the UK, if you've got a, um, if, if your class has got a shielding, we're called, that there are people who, who go out and would do your shopping and collect your meds and stuff for you and stuff like that to make it easier. So maybe in the future once, for those that are still having to quarantine in a way and are still stuck housebound, carrying on with those activities, not just because majority of people are still okay and can go out again if that makes sense it's i think it is still one of these things that acknowledging it's still there for some people yeah and i think i think that's a very valid point and it, it's quite poignant because like you say you just keep it going like it it's yeah. it's almost like it's providing awareness in itself without even saying anything now i'm not saying don't keep raising the awareness but yeah I, I get what you mean. I think it's I think it's just an important thing of saying we are here. I think that's that that, that that's all I want. I want a representation saying we are here, we exist. There are disabled people that that carry normal lives, have partners, have families, go out and do stuff and it might sound quite bad, but it's sort of like from the media perspective where I am. I, even, I only see it if it's the Paralympics or somebody's done something bad and they're trying to avoid benefits or claim benefits or something stupid like that. It's never anything, just a normal person carrying a day-to-day -day life and does everything as a normal, quotation marks, normal person would do. So uh, it's, I, th I think that's what my ultimate gate goal is, where we aren't deemed as some special being who's either in the Paralympics or a benefit fraud. We're just normal people carrying out normal lives just with a disability. Yeah, for sure. And like you say, we want, we don't want pity. We want acknowledgement. No. That's it. Acknowledgement. That's all, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not, I don't want a song to dance about. I don't want that. I literally want to be able to go to the same place as my mates go about having to worry about is the disabled toilet open or, is there a lift working? It's just that—that's all, really. I just want to be able to do everything normally. 
just 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 with the additional features that I'll need to carry that out without a song and a dance. So it's a uh, it's all I want really. So yeah, it's just acknowledgement. Exactly, and I think that's that's quite it's true it's very true and it's it's very important to me to do some stuff like this because you know there's all t sorts of disabilities and accessibility is very um, relative oh, yeah. but also broad so it's yeah. you know it, it's not always just a ramp it's sometimes no. braille on ele elevators or exactly you know it's stuff like that changing like i'm trying to think what they're called changing spaces and stuff like that you can't that's a lot of things the, the definition of accessibility is quite funny at times when they i've seen it a couple of times we, we go away sometimes as a family and get like a little holiday house holiday cottage and you look at some of them and they're like wheelchair accessible disability accessible blah 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 and literally all we've got is a little ramp going over a step and then i'm sat there thinking well that's not accessible for me i can't reach this i can't reach that in your house i can't reach your sink how is that wheelchair accessible? Your front door is wheelchair accessible, but it's not suitable for this. So I think that's a, that's a really good point, actually, where you've got to sort of like acknowledge that are a broad range of disabilities and across that broad range of disabilities, accessibility means a different aspect for each of those. Absolutely. So I, th I think you're, you're quite right there that we're actually... Uh, it is, it's, it's definitely, my, what I might need is probably completely different to what you might need. And the same as a, a, anybody. So it's, 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 I think it's just, yeah. But it's the same with people in general. I, I, yeah. I react to different things that you do. So do it with accessibility and disability as well. It's, it's just one of these things, so. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm gonna leave it at that because that's a perfect yeah. end note. Thank you so much for doing this, Alex. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, helping me raise the awareness. No worries. I hope it wasn't too bad. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, it was great. Thank, thank you. <laughs> no, it's all right. Anytime. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I look forward to seeing your little video you post out. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. You have yourself a good day. Thanks again. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much, then. Yeah, bye. Bye.